Good day, I'd like to welcome everyone here who's gathered for worship. I'm Reverend Pamela Scott and I'm pleased to be serving Strathmore United Church. I'd like to wish everyone a happy Valentine's Day, so uh, I don't know, eat something sweet. And if we were having church, today would be our pancake brunch, preparing uh, for the start of Lent on Wednesday. So do have pancakes today. Our opening psalm is Psalm 50, verses 1 to 6. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God's shines forth. Our God comes and does not keep silence. For him, before him is a devouring fire and a mighty tempest all around him. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge. Christ Jesus, let us worship the God of every blessing. And our opening hymn comes from the Songs for Gospel People, number one, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who, persecute, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Not only that, count yourself blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort, and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens, give a cheer even, for though they don't like it, I do, and all heaven applauds. And to know that you are in good company, my prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. Remembering the context of Jesus, he comes on the scene declaring what he calls the gospel of God, God's good news for the world. The word translated into gospel or good news is the word euangelon, which came into English as a word we don't use very much, evangel. And from it we have the related words evangelize, meaning to good news eyes, and evangelical meaning people with good news. Jesus comes on the scene with God's evangel. The writers of the four Gospels are making a huge point when they use this term. The Roman emperors were using it for their edicts, their throne speeches. They thought of themselves as lords, saviors, and redeemers of the world and their authoritative messages to the empire were called euangelum. The idea was that what comes from the emperor is a saving message, that it's not just a piece of news, but a change of the world for the better. So when the writers of the New Testament use the word euangelon relative to Jesus, what they are saying to us is what the emperors who pretend to be gods, illegitimately claim, really occurs here. Here is the real Lord of the world, the living God, who goes into action. You can see why Jesus' message was so offensive to the authorities and to some of the people, then and now. This is the first double beatitude. The first one stated twice. Is it because this one we would rather not hear? Or is it because this one is the one Jesus himself felt the most? Note carefully the reason for the persecution. Jesus is not blessing those who get persecuted for being obnoxious in peacemaking, or for those who get persecuted for being tactless or who are culturally insensitive as they bear witness to the world. 
He is not congratulating those who are persecuted for being dogmatically dogmatic or narrow-mindedly narrow-minded. He is not applauding the thrill-seeking confrontationalists or those with a victim complex. Jesus is blessing those who find themselves in trouble because of righteousness and because of me, for the sake of right-relatedness and on account of me. Jesus is righteousness personified. The hunger and thirst for righteousness in the fourth beatitude turns out to be a hunger and thirst for Jesus. It is why a hunger and thirst for Jesus always manifests in a hunger and thirst for right relatedness. And Jesus is blessing those who experience opposition and reproach because of their craving to see relationships work and because of their relationship with him. And when persecuted, we are to rejoice. This is not a theoretical matter. Believers all over the world are experiencing persecution today in some really painful ways. According to David Barrett, editor of World Christian Encyclopedia, if we total up the number of Christians martyred for their faith in the 20th century, it works out to an average of 454,000 a year. It is estimated that over 200 million Christians in 60 countries are currently denied basic human rights because of their allegiance with Jesus. In 1990, I traveled to Jordan with Samaritan's Purse. In the city of Amman, we were billeted in a Christian school. Know that in Jordan, if you were born a Christian, that is fine, but you cannot convert to Christianity. That is against the law. The janitor of the school we were staying in had converted and had, by her family, been killed in the school one day when she was finishing up at work. This happened within six months of our staying there. Being persecuted for following Jesus is many believers' reality. Why is being persecuted a mark of those who have turned around and embraced Jesus and his gospel? Well, for one basic reason. The reason Jesus gave on the night before handing himself over to death, when he gathered the first band of disciples together around in an upper room somewhere in downtown Jerusalem. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it has hated you. Remember, the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. It's in the Gospel of John. Why was Jesus persecuted? He was persecuted. He experienced insult and harm by being righteous, by doing righteousness, and by speaking righteously. Jesus got into trouble by simply being righteous. Righteousness is experienced by the unrighteous, either as a blessing or a threat. Those who are drawn to the light, the goodness incarnate, let the light in. Having experienced the light, they will want to reflect the light. Slowly they become like Jesus, a nonconformist. Flannery O'Connor is reputed to have said this, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you odd. Following Jesus puts you in step with God's kingdom values, which are not the world's kingdom values. Doing righteousness, living God's shalom in an unrighteous world, rocks the boat. One example of Jesus rocking the boat? Jesus began to disturb things by always bringing the wrong people to the party. This man receives sinners and eats with them. Jesus' way with people upset the religious establishment whose concept of righteousness and their whole concept of righteousness. They taught that people would have to shape up before being allowed to come home to the Father. Jesus taught that all that people had to do was come home, and the shaping up, well, that would come later. The religious established 
meant could not handle God's righteousness, which is to say they could not handle grace. They wanted to sing, as does anyone who lives by the world's values, anyone who wants to hold on to power sings, I did it my way. Singing and living, be thou my vision, rocks the boat. Jesus, the righteous one, proclaims God's good news, God's evangel. Living this way, focused on God and your relationship with God, with humans, with creation, and with yourself, will be set right. The world will change. It will be as it is intended to be when it was first created. We will live God's shalom. Here is the real Lord of the world, of the living God going into action. With your eyes focused on God, God's glorious kingdom will, in the present, break into one's life. It is because Jesus' gospel is already taking hold that we get caught in the crunch. With this perspective, I might be able to endure any persecution I experience. Maybe even bless the persecuted. Maybe. Let us pray. Dear God, we have just spent time reading and reviewing and studying the Beatitudes. We have just spent time with our eyes focused on Jesus. We ask the living Jesus to make it all real in our lives, my life, your life, in the life of the church, and in the life of the world. We thank you for speaking your Beatitudes, for speaking your divine blessing upon us. We are humbled that you love us enough to give us your perspective on what it means to be human in our world. We are deeply humbled that you love us enough to speak your kingdom into our world. We acknowledge that we are indeed poor in spirit. May this always be our posture before you, so that you are free to do in us what only you can do. We mourn over the state of the world. We grieve that we are not all that you long for us to be. We are moved by the realization that you mourn with us and that your mourning will soon turn into joy and thus ours too. We affirm that gentleness is the way you want us to be in all our relationships. In you we see that gentle do in fact inherit the goodness of creation. Make us like you. We hunger and thirst for you to put things right. We give you thanks for all the ways you are doing this right now, but we long for the day when your great craving will be fulfilled in a fully righteous world. How can we thank you for your mercy? You are mercy, holy mercy. Help us to drink of your mercy, that we may have the strength to extend mercy to all we encounter. Help us to hear the brokenness around us, um, around us cry, someone have mercy on me. You know that we want to be pure in heart. We confess that we cannot make this happen in our lives. Only you can make it so. The pure in heart will see God. Grant that everyone we can see, and that every day we can see what is seeable of you. What and where you reveal yourself in the here and now. Make us makers of shalom. Equip us with every grace we need to be a people of peace. We want to be known as the children of the peacemaking God in all the places we live and work. Jesus, we know that as we seek to live in sync with you and your agenda in this age, we could find ourselves in trouble. We would rather it not happen, but we do thank you for warning us and making it clear why it happens. Should we be persecuted on account of you, please so work in us that we can be like Stephen, who, when he was unjustly being stoned, followed your lead and prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. To you be all glory, now and forevermore. Amen. And our next hymn comes from Voices United 896, Blessed Are They. Thank you.
And if you could turn the dream into concrete goals, what would it be? Surely right now a quick end to COVID-19 pandemic would top the list. Did you know that the United Nations made a list of 17 sustainable development goals for the world? In 2015, the UN vowed to achieve these goals by 2030. The list includes eliminating poverty and hunger, as well as making sure everyone has access to quality education and health care. These are ambitious goals. In light of COVID-19, they are more necessary than ever. The first week of February is International Development Week. During this week, Global Affairs Canada encourages organizations across the country to celebrate the ways we are working to achieve the UN goal. Did you know that your generosity through mission and service supports justice work in 19 countries around the world through 80 trusted organizational partnerships? In Canada, we support 81 life-changing ministries like food banks and shelters. These numbers aren't empty statistics. They reflect real people who, thanks to mission and service, receive the support they need. This support means they can access crucial things the goals highlight, like clean water, food, education, and health care. The sustainability goals are important because we are all interconnected, and as people of faith, we are called to care about the world. What's happening globally affects us here, and what happens here has a global impact, says Thayvan Hoeng, Program Coordinator for Sustainable Development and Humanitarian Response at the United Church of Canada. In the 2019, I mean, the, yeah, in the COVID-19 crisis, we have seen, for example, how parts of the world that don't have the means or governance to protect and vaccinate affect us all. This crisis has really underlined that there is no that there is no one of us and no no us and them. We are one community. Keeping our eyes on the goal reminds us of that. Mission and service is your church, our church in action. Together we work to achieve life-changing, indeed, world-changing goals. Mission and service is the one of these ways we are living the dream, God's dream of a world where no one goes hungry, no one lacks health care, and no one feels alone. Freely you have received, freely give. With joy we now present our offerings to the commitment and support of the work of Christ Church. We praise you for the light leaping across the northern skies. 
and for the joys of blade upon ice, ski upon snow, fire in the hearth, and friends for celebration. We praise you also for your continuing presence in a world where wealth has so much to say, and the wicked prosper, and relationships go sour, and hearts and dreams are broken. In laughter and in tears alike, we praise you. We praise you for the peace of the world, O God. And we pray you for peace of the world, and we pray for peace that only you can give not only for the absence of conflict and battle, but also for the fullness of life that is prosperity for all, goodwill among neighbors, and welcome for every outsider. Hear us now as we name the situations and nations for which we seek your shalom. In our own country, Canada, Families buffeted by storm of economic despair. War-torn countries. Our families, our friends, ourselves. Be with students as they navigate the challenges of learning in a world affected with COVID restrictions, and to be with teachers and educators as they create environments conducive for learning. We ask that you gather our prayers, those spoken and those held deep within our hearts, and bless us as we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our closing hymn today is Songs for Gospel People 134, To Show by Touch and Word.
be with you. Pick up the phone, email, Twitter, Zoom someone today and share Christ's peace.